guys, it's Emily Graziano here, and I'm here to do a review of the first ever Bruce Kulick album called Audio Dog, which was released October 23rd, 2001. Here's a picture of it. I had to listen to this album, by the way, digitally, because I do not own it physically, and I feel like I'm cheating whenever I have to do that. That's such a cheat. I don't feel genuine. I feel really synthetic when I do that, honest to God. Um... So I was five years old when this album was released. I was in kindergarten, and l I swear to you, I have no memory of this album coming out. Like, I don't think my mom was aware it was coming out, or she did know. She just, it wasn't on her radar, because, you know, around 2001, Kiss was kind of in limbo, kind of, sort of speak. Like, Eric Singer had done those Japanese and Australian dates, which... At the time, being four to five years old, I didn't believe happened because it's like, well, it didn't happen in America. It happened overseas, so it's not real, which is the dumbest thing for me to think considering that I'm not from America. And I've actually been to Japan, so, um, okay, it, for, it was for like for less than 24 hours, but I was in Japan, people. I was. Um, so I have no idea why I thought that about kiss but I think it was me trying to process the fact that Peter had left even though Peter had left once before that was my brain trying to justify it in my mind because Peter Chris in my lifetime like at that point I mean there there was no like Peter was the drummer like uh, yeah I'd watch clips of Eric Singer and Eric Carr, but, like, Peter leaving the band is like, what? No, no, he's back. He can't leave again. So that was me trying to process that when I was little. Um, this is very interesting cover artwork. The illustration was done by a guy called Chuck Wright, and then, um, Glenn Lafairman did the photography, but the illustration, there's some nods to Kiss here. There is a Shikara symbol. There's kind of like a skull, maybe a little bit reminiscent of the Revenge skull from the tour. And then if you look over here, there's a Sphinx, which is kind of like a reference to Hot in the Shade. Uh, there's guitar. There's even, um, look, the, um, the Illuminati eye, I think they call it. So yeah, really interesting, uh, illustration. Um, let's see, what I, what else did I write down here? Oh, the name Audio Dog comes from Bruce's dog named Joe, which I think is the sweetest, most cute thing ever, that he incorporated his dog into it, because guys, I'm a dog person, remember that? Um, Bruce plays the bass guitars, and he does the vocals on here. Kurt Como does the keyboards, and Kurt Como also worked with Kiss on Psycho Circus. Kenny Arnoff and Bent Fence, they play the drums on this album. The instrumentals on this album were all solo written by Bruce, and the others were written by both Bruce and Kurt. So yeah, when this album came out, I was in kindergarten, and like I said, I don't think I remember this album coming out that much because I was in kindergarten. Uh, kindergarten was half a day only, but still, it's like, gotta go to school. I mean, I mean, they have a lunch in school, but yeah, kindergarten, kindergarten, I enjoyed it, but it, it was also a little boring, because we had to go over, like, shades, colors, numbers, penmanship, and I already knew all that, so I was kind of bored at school. I liked going to school, because I got to sit with my friends at the blue table, so I was at the blue crayon um, table, because they had these little labels with crayon, and I got to sit at the blue one, and I got to sit with all my friends, like, we all became friends, so that was pretty nice. But yeah, this is actually the first time I'm hearing this album, so it's pretty interesting to know that I was five when it came out, and now listening to it for the first time at 26 is very interesting. So, first track on here. By the way, there's 11 tracks uh, on here. I believe three instrumentals, and then there's two bonus tracks that appear on later editions, and I'll go over those when we get to them. But anyway, first track on here is an instrumental called Pair of Dice. Much like Ace, Bruce demonstrates with this track, he is first and foremost a guitar player. Maybe even more so that he's first and for foremost a guitar player, even more than Ace. Because Ace, he will sing and it doesn't bother him, but Bruce... He's happy to be the lead guitarist and backup singer, 
and it doesn't bother him if he doesn't sing lead. So by starting off of an instrumental, it's like, yeah, this is who I am. I'm a guitar player. Remember that? Um, and I feel like this instrumental, out of all of them on here, this could have lyrics. I, I kept picturing it. I'm like, wow, this could have lyrics. Just the way that it flows and it goes along. Um, it's almost like a backing track rather than an instrumental. Interesting. Second song on here, which is the first vocal from Bruce, is called Strange to Me. And it's interesting because it's like, wow, this is a little bit strange. I mean, we have the one vocal track from um, Bruce on Carnival of Souls. Wait, is this crooked? Okay. Uh, and that's I Walk Along. But it's like, wow, this is kind of new territory. It's Bruce on lead vocal. It's kind of strange to me. It kind of, it's very fitting. Um, but you feel the Kiss influence here, but yet it's also a Bruce original, and it's really cool. I really dig the song. Third song on here, Change is Coming. This is a very, very Carnival of Souls-ish song. It feels like it was almost cut off from Carnival of Souls, and that you could almost picture Paul Stanley singing the lead vocal. It's uncanny. It's like, it starts and you're like, wait. And then it keeps going, and you're like, oh, is this, th this could be on Carnival of Souls. And then you hear Bruce's vocal, and you're like, I could picture Paul singing that. And you're like, wow, this has to be a cutoff of, Paul, of, of Carnival of Souls. It has to be. Next song, Need Me. This is the most gritty song on the album, and it's really, really fun. I dig it. There's a Master and Slave reference in the lyrics, which is probably unintentional, but it's really fun for us KISS fans. So I really like that. I really dig this song. Next song, I Don't Mind. This is a ballad song, and it's kind of like a rock and roll power ballad song. It's not my favorite, but it's still really good. Um... I don't know why it's not my favorite. Maybe I haven't listened to it enough times, but it, to me it's not memorable, but it's not skippable. You can listen to it, but when it's over, you're like, okay, next song. But it's not bad, okay? It isn't. Next song is called Monster Island, and it's an instrumental. And this, to me, sounds like video game music. Like, background music for a video game, or like video game menus, um... Growing up, there used to be background music on, like, the utility menu or the pause menu or something like that on video games. And it's actually the perfect title because you really do feel like you're on this monster island. It could almost be, like, background music, I feel, for, like, a Scooby-Doo movie. That would be really fun. So, I really like that. It could be... Here. Here we go. Background music for a Scooby-Doo video game. There you go. <laughs> I just, I didn't even write that down. I came up with it. Okay, next song. Please Don't Wait. This is another ballad song, but it's kind of more melodic. It actually reminds me of the style of music of songs that I heard on the radio in like the early 2000s and like my youth around like kindergarten, first grade, that era. And when it started, I'm like, wait, do I know this song? Because it's so familiar, but it's familiar in a comforting way, not familiar in a rip-off way. It's more comforting, and um, I thought I'd actually heard it before, but I hadn't. I, I really enjoy it because it just brings me back to that youth, well, my youth. <laughs> and um, when I close my eyes, I can almost picture that I'm back in that time, that era of my life. So I really enjoy that. Next song on here is an instrumental called Liar, and to me, out of all the instrumentals on this album, this is the most ace of all the instrumentals. It's basically how ace would approach an instrumental, and when you ace does an instrumental, the guitar basically takes the place of the vocalist, right? So much so that you could actually hum ace's um, guitar parts or sing it by humming it. So this is very, very much an ace instrumental, and I, I really enjoy that. But it's but you got to remember it's Bruce, and you do know that. But it's just the ace approach, I guess. So that's really, really cool. Next song on here, I can't take it. Sorry, no, I can't take. There isn't. It's, there's no it. Sorry, I can't take it. But I feel like that's just a natural phrase, but it's just called I can't take. This is a very, very ace song and i love that um the vocal styling the tone the way it is arranged and if you close your eyes 
and you imagine Ace Frehley singing it, you could totally imagine Ace singing this song. It's so Ace influenced and that's awesome. And that's, I have to say bravo to Bruce because it's like, wow, this is so like Ace and like Kiss connected that it's amazing. It's amazing. Next song, Dogs of Morrison. This is the final vocal on the album. This isn't awful, but it's not memorable. Honestly, it's not my favorite, and that's really sad because it has the title of dog in in the um, title. And it's probably my least favorite song on the album, definitely. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm so sorry. Moving on. Last song on the album, on the uh, original release of the album, Skydrome. It's an instrumental. This is the final track, like I said, and this almost feels like it's closing credits. Like, we open with an instrumental, and we close with an instrumental, therefore uh, horning in the fact that, yes, Bruce is a guitarist, and he can sing, it's just it doesn't bother him if he does it, and um, that's really really the message here I think especially for the first solo album in his name I mean he's done things with Union and uh, he did things of Eric Singer Project and stuff like that but this is the first album under Bruce's name so it's again telling you hey I'm a guitar player and that's where it's at okay there's two bonus tracks that were in issued on like re-releases over the years. The first one is an instrumental called 495. Um, I love the drums on this track. It's almost, they're almost the scene stealer over the guitar. It's like, wow, these drums are insane. I love that. And um, it has some really cool shredding by Bruce and that's awesome. And the next one is also an instrumental kind of in the sense Bruce sings to Joe and Joe is his dog and he's the the, he's the audio dog for this album and I think this is so sweet I don't care if it's not technically proficient or it's not or it's just like um you know informal I don't care I think it's so sweet because dogs do listen they listen better than people they have better empathy than people and they are really capable of feeling and picking up the atmosphere around them so I think it's so sweet that Basically, for the whole time of this album, Joe, the audio dog, was like right by Bruce's side having a ton of influence. And I think that is so sweet, so fitting. That's why the album is called Audio Dog in the first place. And I just think that that's really, really sweet. It's adorable. And a little note to note, this is, Audio Dog is Bruce's first album. Again, I don't own it, which is why I had to listen to it digitally. And I felt so synthetic and fake. I felt I was cheating by doing that. Um, but I do own his third album. But because um, I'm kind of like Miss Completist and a little bit neurotic, I guess, in the sense of I have to do things nice and orderly fashion. I'm like, okay, I have to review his first album. I mean, he only has two albums before his third one naturally because it's the third one but there's only two albums before that I should just really review Bruce's first two albums first but I don't own them and I feel really bad because I don't own them so I I did listen to it digitally and I didn't let that stop me but I felt really really fake about it <laughs> I just feel so fake when I do that but I do own this third album BK3 which I do want to review I got it for a birthday present last year and I'm so sorry that it's overdue but I do promise to review it um, and I'll hold it up in the video because um, that's credit I, I feel like I'm really invalid because I I held up a freaking iPad to show you the artwork for audio dog okay but um, I really hope you liked this review. Um, let me know what you think. Do you have Audio Dog? Do you remember when it came out? What was your initial thoughts on this album? Do you think that it's aged well? Let me know in the comments below. And I will do Bruce's next album, Transformer Next, followed by BK3. Until then, I'm Emily Graziano. I hope you really enjoyed this review. I will see you in the next one. Have a great day and bye-bye.